Hallelujah, we're going to see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the King. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday night virtual Bible class. Uh, so happy to see everyone. I hope you're all encouraged and uh, especially be more encouraged by our lesson and our discussion and our uh, continued fellowship this evening. Amen. Uh, before we begin, we just have a few announcements. Uh, the first one is with, is with regards to uh, Zoom. Uh, please make sure you check the view uh, toggle button in the top right uh, corner of the Zoom to make sure that it's reading gallery view to make sure that you enable speaker view. Uh, with regards to uh, streaming services, we are only streaming uh, Wednesday night Bible class at 7.30 p.m. Uh, and Sunday services uh, 2 p.m. Uh, we encourage everyone to show up 15 minutes early uh, to just make sure that technology is working fine. And we are streaming on uh, YouTube, Facebook, Zoom, and Instagram as well. Next slide, please. Uh, with regards to contribution, uh, we have uh, two options. You can do it online uh, using Subsplash or also uh, mailing a physical check uh, the week prior uh, to the following Sunday. And uh, we just ask that you continue to help us uh, share the gospel in social media by liking, following, and subscribing. Next slide, please. And uh, if I know we're using an electronic device right now, but uh, any additional uh, devices that would be dis uh, distractive to us, uh, we ask that you just put in a vibrant mode, silent mode, uh, so that we are all focused. And uh, with that said, let's uh, open up with a word of prayer. Most righteous and eternal God, we thank you so much uh, for just giving us this time, Father God, to just even pray to you, recognizing that uh, you are the God uh, of the universe. You're the the God of everything, Father God, uh, the seen and the unseen, Father God. And we just want to take all confidence in that and in you, Father God, as we uh, go through this uh, trying time, Father God, uh, dealing with a, a, a global pandemic. But we just thank you that you've uh, carved out this opportunity for us, Father God, to meet um, as a body and I study your word and receive that, uh, that encouragement, Father God. And I pray, Lord, that as our brother uh, Pedro uh, shares the word today, Lord, I pray that it may prick our hearts, encourage us, and uh, continue to motivate us, Father God, to uh, continue to live lives that are glorifying to you. Thank you so much once again. This I pray in your son's precious name. Amen. Thank you, Darren, and welcome, everybody, to another Bible class. Uh, I am so encouraged to see you all here tonight. We've got 81 uh, brothers and sisters connected, and I feel encouraged. I feel like I'm in the presence of you all, even though we can't shake hands or hug, uh, but just seeing your lovely faces on the Zoom. I don't know, it gives me a sense of fellowship, even though it's virtual, so I'll take that. So uh, thank you. Your presence is very encouraging and uplifting. I praise God for your faithfulness throughout this pandemic, your attendance, your generosity that continues. Uh, I know the Lord is blessing us greatly. So we're going to continue on. We're almost done, I promise, uh, but we're not going to be done tonight, though. <laughs> Maybe one or two more classes. Uh, but we started Titus chapter 3, uh, and we were only able to cover one of the points he mentions. There's quite a few things Paul talks to Titus about. The first one we covered last week, which was to remind the people. So we talked about what he needed to remind the people of. Today we're going to talk about things that Paul wanted Titus to stress. In particular, the trustworthy saying that he mentions in verse 4 through 7. And this trustworthy saying is about the kindness and the love of God, basically about the grace of God, similar to what we talked about before. Salvation by rebirth and renewal, justification, just the major doctrinal points of salvation. He says these are the things that 
the evangelist needs to stress and remind the people, being heirs of the hope of eternal life. Then the last few things he mentions in chapter 3 is avoiding foolish controversies and warning of divisive people. Then the last thing he mentions in Titus is that the evangelist should really do everything that he can to help brethren accomplish their mission. So that's kind of like an overview of what we're going to do today. We're not going to finish chapter 3 today, possibly, but we're going to cover most of it. <clears throat> so let's go to verse 8 of Titus chapter 3, where Paul will say, this is a trustworthy saying. And I want you to stress these things. So what was the trustworthy saying? Well, we're going to read verses 4 through 7, not now, but verses 4 through 7 is these trustworthy sayings that Paul says here, I want you to stress these things. And basically the trustworthy sayings, remember I did a lesson on the five trustworthy sayings. They're all about the major doctrinal points of salvation. So he wants the evangelist to stress these major doctrinal points. In other words, the life and death doctrines of the Bible. We ought to stress those so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. What things? Well, the doctrinal points about salvation, the trustworthy sayings, basically. So the evangelist needs to stress these things. When somebody tells you to stress something, that means repeat, repeat, repeat. Don't uh, worry about sounding repetitive. Emphasize these things, right? Why? Two things, two reasons why the evangelist needs to stress these things. Number one, so that our trust in God is shown by our devotion to doing what is good. And he's going to repeat that at the very end of Titus chapter 3 as well. The importance of all of us, not just the evangelists, but all of us in the church, devoting ourselves, getting busy, doing good things. And the way that we're going to get about to do that is by hearing the life and death teachings constantly, remembering about the grace of God and how we are saved. The second reason why the evangelists ought to stress these things is because uh, so that everybody is blessed by what is excellent and profitable, so that everything can be advantageous for the members. So what are the things that he wants to stress? And here's where we're going to go on verses 4 through 7 of chapter 3. So we're going to take this verse by verse. These are life and death teachings, right? These are the doctrinal points of the gospel that the evangelist needs to stress. The kindness and the love of God that appeared. Well, how did it appear? How did God's kindness and love all of a sudden appear? Of course, in Jesus Christ. Paul will say to the Philippians, Jesus, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but made himself nothing, and being found in appearance as a man. This is the appearing of the kindness and the love of God incarnate in Jesus Christ. And so the proof of God's love is the cross, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, so whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So the appearing of Jesus is proof that God really loves us. Because it says it here in this verse, God gave us his one and only son as proof of his love. And the gospel is proof of God's kindness. The gospel, the fact that Jesus did die to save us, is proof of the kindness of God. That's because God justified us. You know, Romans 4.25 says that he was raised to life for our justification. How did he justify us? Colossians 2.13 and 14 tell us we were made alive with Christ. Why? Because all our sins were forgiven, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness. So whatever legal indebtedness that we had 
that stood out before God, that charge that stood against us, that condemned us because of our sin. In Jesus, our sins were forgiven. That was canceled. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. So that's how we receive our justification. The next trust, the next point of the trustworthy saying here in Titus 3 is that we were saved by the washing of rebirth and renewal. We're not saved by our good deeds. There's nothing that we can do that merits us salvation. We're saved by his mercy. By rebirth, as it says in John 3, 5, as Jesus says, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born again. We have to be born of water and be born of spirit. And renewal, rebirth and renewal. Rebirth speaks of the first step of salvation. Renewal is the continuous renewing that we undergo in Jesus Christ as we conform to him and not the world. This verse here in Ezekiel speaks of that renewal. It was a prophecy of how we were going to be renewed. We were going to be given a new heart and the new spirit. God in Christ was going to remove our heart of stone, our dead heart that was all about the passions of the flesh. And he was going to give us a heart of flesh, a willing heart that wanted to obey. He says, I will put my spirit in you, move you, motivate us to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So this is the renewal God promised that happens in baptism that was fulfilled when Jesus Christ completed the gospel and gave us the opportunity now to be participants of that gospel. And we're also renewed by the Holy Spirit. That's how it happens. Uh, and when we repent, when we're baptized, we're forgiven. That's how the code is canceled in our favor. And we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You know, the job of the Holy Spirit has always been to create. He was there at the beginning, creating the world, speaking the world into existence. And now his job is to recreate us in the form of Christ. He is the one who gives us order to our life. He gives us purpose, meaning. He's good at it. We got to let him do it. And as we see here, the Spirit has been generously, Titus 3 says, has been generously poured out on us through Jesus Christ. The next point of this trustworthy saying that the evangelist needs to stress is how we are justified by grace. Yes, in Christ we were washed. That's the rebirth. We were sanctified. That's the renewal. We're also justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we become the righteousness of God. So in Christ, we're justified. That justification was proven by the fact that Jesus was raised, that the work was done. The work of the gospel was accomplished. It was successful. And so when he was raised, he was raised to life for our justification. And uh, that's a fancy word, justification, but it means, just like it says here, just as if I'd never sinned. God made it so that when we unite ourselves with Christ in baptism, it's like we never sinned. So now we have a living hope, as he points out here in this last point of the trustworthy saying that we need to stress. We're heirs now, having the hope of eternal life. We receive a glorious inheritance beyond any riches known to man. And that's because in Jesus Christ, we've been blessed in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. We don't even know what they are. We might experience some of them here, maybe. Uh, but he says, in the heavenly realms, we have every spiritual blessing in Christ. This is what a living hope means. Any hope here on this earth is dead. It's dead because it's going to get finished. It's going to cease. It's limited. But the hope that we have, as Peter says, it's a living hope. And notice how Peter in this passage kind of recreates 
all the major doctrinal points that Paul told the evangelists to stress. I have them here in bold letters. In his great mercy, there's the love and the kindness of God, right? He gave us new birth. There's the rebirth into a living hope through the resurrection of Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This eternal life that we have, it doesn't just speak to the quantity of life. Yes, it's eternal as opposed to limited. But the word eternal here really stands, what stands out is the quality of life that we're going to have because the unrighteous and the wicked will be raised as well. But it's going to be not a good eternal, uh, but we are going to have a good eternal life. <clears throat> Next in verse 9, uh, Paul stresses to Titus here. He says, avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. So in the last verse, the evangelist is told to, what he needs to stress the points of doctrine that he really needs to stress, all of them having to do with the life and death doctrines of the gospel, the things that really bring us hope. Those are the important things. Those are the heavy things. And avoid what? Foolish controversies, genealogies, arguments, quarrels about the law, anything that's not attached, basically, to these big, stressful points of doctrine. We need to avoid those. The evangelists should not get pulled into controversies, arguments, quarrels about conspiracies or opinions, genealogies, or the law. Basically, that word law there had to do with scripture, arguments about scripture, you know, uh, about words or definitions or things like that. Because these can go nowhere fast. And if it ends up in a, in a quarrel, in an argument, they won't edify or instruct. Anytime somebody wants to get into an argument, arguments are all about ego. They're not about truth. And that's why he says here they are unprofitable and useless. It's a waste of time to try to instruct anyone who's more interested in giving you their opinion than in learning. <laughs> are they answering your questions or are they just or do they just want to hear themselves speak. As we read in this proverb, fools find no pleasure in understanding, but delight in airing their own opinions. <laughs> now, sometimes people can deceive you. It's happened to me. They lay out a trap, kind of like how they did for Jesus, how the Pharisees always looked to trap Jesus in an argument. Some people, that's what they like to do. You know, they want to win arguments. They want to appear more intellectual or more knowledgeable or about something. So we'll try to lay out a trap to get you to argue or quarrel with them because maybe that makes them feel smart. I don't know. Maybe that makes them feel purposeful. But we don't want to become a validation chip for their foolish ego. We don't want to be used to puff them up. <laughs> Instead, walk away. You know, let the Lord lead you to souls that want to know the truth, that want to be led. Uh, so that's what we got to avoid, foolish controversies. What are foolish controversies? Well, the Greek here means absurd questions. Uh, sometimes people like to pose what ifs, and sometimes they want to make a case out of a what if, which is a totally made up situation. It's, it's unreal. It may never happen. Well, that's absurd. Those are absurd questions. Uh, uh, disputes or foolish themes. Genealogies. What does he mean by genealogies? Well, the Greek word there means tracing by generations. That was very important for the Jews of Paul's day. You know, they traced their rights to priesthoods by claiming to be in the lineage of Levi. So for them, it was very important that they were able to trace their genealogy. And so they might have validated someone as a legitimate teacher just because he came from the gene genealogy of a priest. That was their specialty. Uh, and that's why 
to a certain extent, both Matthew and Luke write Jesus' complete genealogy there at the beginning, because it was important for the Jews to know these things. But nevertheless, that led to so many disputes, particularly between two schools of thought at the time, two Jewish schools of thought, the Hillel school of thought and the Shama school of thought, which offered different interpretations about the Levitical genealogies. It's kind of like the same dispute that Muslims have uh, between the Sunnis and the Shiites. You know, what's the dispute about? Genealogies. <laughs> so, I mean, most of us don't really care about that nowadays. But for the Jews, it was very important, as it is even for the Muslims. <clears throat> what about dissensions, arguments? Arguments are dissensions, contentions, uh, quarrels about the law, you know, battles, controversies about scriptures, people saying that the Bible contradicts itself or that uh, this passage doesn't mean this, it means that, and they want to get into all the Greek vocabulary. You know, there is some value to understanding things, but not to prevent, not to present a controversy or a dispute. We want to get to know the scriptures to present the cohesiveness and the importance of the trustworthy sayings, the life and death points, doctrinal points of the gospel. Engaging in a debate or in a discussion, you know, some people think debates are healthy and some may be if they're done correctly, but most of the time, if it's going to end up in disputes, he says here, it's unprofitable, it's useless, it's worthless. We're to defend the truth against those who speak foolishness, but we defend it because we're interested in those who want to believe and want to accept the gospel. Those who seek to be divisive, like Paul will say in the next verse here, in verse 10, they are self-condemned and need no defending, as he says, uh, sorry, in the next verse, verse 10, he'll say, Warn a divisive person once, then warn them a second time. And after that, have nothing to do with them. So the evangelist needs to warn these people who want to continue engaging in a controversy. Actually, the, the, the word here, divisive person, in the Greek is derived from the word heretic, heretic somebody who speaks heresy who speaks against sound doctrine, basically, right? So there's no third warning. There's no third base here, you know? You get two warnings, and that's it. That's because these people want to stir up division. And what does it mean to stir up division? As he says in verse 10, he says, uh, warn a divisive person, people who are heretics, who want to stir up division. Well, stirring up division can look like defiantly opposing the leadership of the church. We have various examples in the scriptures. I'll bring them to you in our next Bible class. We'll get a little bit more into this verse, but uh, Jonas and Jambres opposed Moses and many other leaders just, you know, right up and disagreed. And, and not because of a reasonable thing, but just because of their ego, just because they were proud, just because they wanted to stand out. And these are the people that the evangelist only gives two warnings to. To stir up division also means to break up from the fellowship, to, kind of, to start your own group, uh, which in the New Testament some wanted to do. And Paul uh, condemned them right away for trying to do that, breaking off from the fellowship, starting their own school of thought. Stirring up division also could mean maliciously gossiping. If I hear a brother uh, saying something, or, or see, most of the time gossip starts by secondhand hearing, not even firsthand hearing. I may be eavesdropping, or I may have thought I heard something, and instead of going to that person to clear it up, which is what we need to do, Jesus said, that's what we need to do in Matthew 18, right? Instead of doing that, I'll gossip about it. You know, I'll tell somebody else. And I may not be 
maliciously trying to start a division, but guess what? It, that's how divisions start, get started. So we have to be very, very careful. We don't create division by gossiping. Instead, if you have doubts about what somebody said or questions, go to the source. Don't go tell somebody else about it. Clear it up. Most of the times you'll realize it was all in your own head. So don't get pulled into controversy by uh, being alarmed about something you thought you heard or you misread or misheard. Stirring up the division can also mean teaching false doctrine, uh, just outright, you know, teaching false doctrine or refusing uh, to stop engaging in these useless controversies. That's what it could mean as well. Now, what it is not, let's, I talked about you what it is, what it's not, offering suggestions to the leadership is not <laughs> uh, stirring up division. If I disagree with a brother in the church, or if I have reservations about something that I think is being taught or a practice that I don't understand and I want to go and talk to the Bible teacher or preacher about it, that's not stirring up division. I want to get something clarified. That's perfectly good and that's what the church is about. If I offer a personal criticism to a church leader, that's fine. That's not stirring up division. I'm perfectly within my own right as a brother to question another brother about something or get some clarification or give a critique. I want to be able to do it in a humble way. Sometimes it might not come across that way, but uh, it's not stirring up division. Uh, Romans chapter 14 is all about matters of conscience and, and matters of opinion. And when we wanna honestly seek answers, to questions of conscience, uh, that's not stirring up division either. You know, th that's, those are good, healthy conversations to have as long as we genuinely want to do those things. We want to have our conscience cleared about something. Sometimes that even takes some time. We might have a conversation with somebody about a matter of conscience. It might not get resolved right away. That's perfectly fine. Each of us grows, you know, at a different pace. And uh, eventually, you know, your conscience hopefully will be cleared. Now, let's say if I have to disagree with someone in the church on uh, biblical grounds, and I need to point out a doctrine or a practice that's not biblical to the church leadership, that's not stirring up division either. That's actually our role. That's our responsibility to make sure that we're of one mind. Uh, being lazy, being spiritually lazy, being apathetic, <laughs> being lukewarm, or less than zealous in our work in the church or in our support of the activities of the church, that's not being divisive either. It's not profitable for you personally. <laughs> and yes, the idol need to be warned, as Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.14, but it's not the same treatment as somebody who is actively trying to be divisive. 